time are named earnings manipulation techniques to assess earnings quality. My name is Maroon Zghib. I appreciate if you can type a hi or something in the typing box just to make sure that we are all aligned and you are hearing what I'm saying. Okay, so I see that Maruf is hearing me, Maher is hearing me. Anyone else available as well? Okay, so I will assume that most of you are attending this session. Again, you're welcome. Uh, as a way of introduction, uh, my name is Maroon Zghib and I'm a senior consultant with Merck Training and Consulting specialized in finance and financial reporting. Um, before join, joining Merck, um, I worked for several years with Deloitte and PricewaterhouseCoopers in the auditing and tax consulting divisions. Um, currently, I'm a licensed US CPA. Um, I'm a CFA charter holder and a holder of diploma in IFRS. Uh, so today, our session will be around earnings manipulation. What do we mean by earnings manipulation? What is the difference between financial reporting quality and earnings quality? How to identify if the earnings have been manipulated or the financial reports have been manipulated? And we're going to discuss some of the techniques that enable finance managers and analysts to identify if the financial statements are facing any manipulation. Uh, first, uh, we'll start by defining what is financial reporting quality versus earnings quality. The financial reporting quality um, is basically around uh, the financial statements uh, accuracy if they are following IFRS, uh, if the financial statements uh, are disclosing in the notes all the necessary information, relevant information for users in order to make a sound decision, uh, if they are providing information for investors, lenders, in order to make a decision about providing capital to the company, whether it is a loan to the company or a long-term investment as ownership investment in the company. Um, so basically, financial reporting quality is about the correctness, it's about the completeness, and it's about the neutrality and the financial rules or accounting rules that are adopted by the company's management. Whereas on the other hand, earnings quality, um, which is somehow interrelated, it's an interrelated attribute to the financial reporting quality, uh, it basically pertains uh, to the earnings and cash generated by the company. So that's uh, earnings uh, quality versus financial reporting quality. So financial reporting quality is about the relevance of financial information. It's about the disclosures. It's about the accuracy of financial rules. Whereas earnings quality is about the sustainability. It's about the ability of the company to regenerate revenues, to regenerate the expenses in the future. Um, now, the question is, what is more detrimental to the company or what is more dangerous to the company? Is it having low financial reporting quality or having low earnings quality? What do you think? I appreciate if you can write down an answer, give me your opinion. Okay, I can see Maher is typing, Maruf is typing. Anyone else would like to low financial reporting and Maruf is saying low earnings quality. Anyone else would like to add his opinion? So here we are debating whether it is more detrimental to have low financial reporting quality or low earnings quality. Okay, since low financial reporting quality is more related to the accuracy of financial statement than basically if the financial reporting quality is low, then this impedes the assessment of earning quality and impedes valuation. So if the low financial reporting quality is faced by the analyst, then this is a no-go. You cannot continue to evaluate whether the earnings are a high quality or not. Because low financial reporting quality means a false or wrong or manipulated financial statement. And this means that verifying whether the quality of earnings is high or low is unnecessary in this case. You need to justify the differences, you need to amend, you need to improve on the financial reporting quality, and then you continue with the earnings quality. 
Accordingly, the quality of financial reporting increases. This increases the ability of financial statement users to assess the earnings quality and not vice versa. High earnings quality does not mean that you are able to assess the financial reporting quality. Now we're going to look at the quality spectrum um, where we're going to combine, merge, and conclude regarding the financial reporting quality and the earnings quality. Uh, the highest level of financial reporting starts whenever companies are basically following IFRS. They are following the correct rules. Uh, within IFRS, they are choosing the accounting policies that basically represent the economic, um, uh, the economic underlying of the transaction rather than the form of the transaction. So basically, they emphasize the substance of the transaction over the form. And the weakest or the lowest part of the spectrum is fictitious transactions. Throughout the quality spectrum, we will see that earnings manipulation comes into play. We will see how companies in the past, we're going to give you actual incidents that happened in the past where companies manipulated their financial statements. So first, the first part of the quality spectrum is companies following IFRS, which allows useful decisions, it's sustainable, and adequate returns. In this case, correct financial reporting rules are adopted. Earnings are regularly generated from core operations, no extraordinary or non-recurrent items or transactions. Now we move down the spectrum and we see the cases where companies are following IFRS, which allows useful decision. However, we are not sure if the earnings are sustainable or not. In this case, I am specifically talking about incidents or, or events or transactions where the company actually is abiding by IFRS. They are sticking by IFRS. But from an analyst perspective, even adopting IFRS in this case could be misleading. One of those cases can be, for example, a provision for restructuring. So if a company is recording a provision for restructuring during a certain year, usually recording provisions for restructuring can be correct. The entity decided to restructure its operations, close down a line of business, reshuffle its employees, lay off some of its employees. Definitely the company will incur a major loss at this event. However, when the company incurs this loss, it will be recorded at once, instantly in one year in P&L. If an analyst is following a company and he looks at this restructuring provision in a certain year, assuming year 2015, he will say, okay, fine, during 2015, the company did not perform well, whereas in 2014, it performed well, in 2013, it was good, in 2012, even, it was good. But let's actually look at this incident. When the company decided in 2015 to stop its operations and restructure them, this did not happen overnight. The company has been facing financial difficulties. The company has been facing operational difficulties throughout the years. Accordingly, when the company decided to book this provision, it was only the booking in 2015, whereas the events or incidents that led to this restructuring occurred in the previous years. Another example in line with this is the impairment for long-lived assets. So if a company books an impairment for long-lived assets in a certain year, do you think that this impairment occurred overnight? Definitely not. When the company booked for the impairment, it's only because during this year, the company made the exercise to calculate the impairment loss. But in fact, when line of businesses, geographical locations, products are impaired, the impairment never happens overnight. The impairment actually is the result of weakening of financial performance over several and several years before the impairment loss is booked. So one, if we are standing at this point in time during this year and looking at the company's financial statements, which actually include the impairment losses or the provisions, they are compliant with IFRS, but they do not represent the economic relevance of the transaction. Even when you are looking forward in the future, when you are looking at those provisions and impairments, those provisions and impairments should actually be ignored from the analyst's analysis. Another example can be reverses of impairments, reverses of provisions, extraordinary gains on sale of some of the investments. Those are transactions that when recorded, they are in, compl in compliance with IFRS. However, they are not representative of the norm. Now, I'm gonna give you a case and we will try to conclude how the returns or how the 
earnings were not sustainable. This is an excerpt from Toyota Motor Corporation's consolidated financial statements, uh, the quarterly financial statements of year 2014 versus year 2013. Um, if you can see, during year 2014 and the first quarter of 2014, Toyota sold 37,000 cars or 37,000 units less than its sales in the same period, comparative period in financial year 2013. So they sold 2,232,000 in 2014, whereas in 2013, they were selling 2,270,000 or something. However, on the other side, we saw that the operating income increased by 310 billion Japanese yen, or 87.9% in 2014 as compared to 2013. So from one side, we saw that the quantity of cars sold decreased, whereas revenues or operating profit from Toyota's core operations increased by 87.9%. Now, the experts in Toyota's financial statement actually indicate why this increase occurred. Although there has been a decrease in the sale, although there has been a decrease in the quantity sold, we can see a major increase in the revenues. What do you think the factors contributing to the increase? Why do you think that the revenues of Toyota actually increased from year 2014 to year 2013? So basically, quantity sold decreased, the quantity sold decreased, whereas revenues and operating profits increased significantly. Do you think that Toyota committed any fraud? Anybody says that Toyota committed a fraud? I can see there are some people who are not participating yet. Anis, can you give us your, your opinion? Guru, do we have a guru here? Can you give us your opinion? Lucina, Muhammad, Osama, Zakaria, Nabil, any person, can you give us your opinion, please? So as we can see, the quantity sold decreased by 37,000 units, whereas operating income increased by 310 billion Japanese yen. I can see Nabil is typing. Why do you think, Nabil, extraordinary gains? Okay, so Nabil is saying extraordinary gains. I'm going to tell you in a while if this is the right answer or not. Anis? So the question is revenues and operating profits increased although units sold decreased that was the plan to gain money but after two years that was the plan to gain money so um, I have two different answers. Nabil is mentioning it's related to extraordinary gains, and Anis is mentioning it was a plane to gain money. Um, I, I, would, I would thank you both for your answers. Uh, Nabil, I like your answer. In case Toyota booked extraordinary gains within their operating profit, which is basically an incorrect classification as per IFRS, then their operating income would have increased. It's a very good way to approach this. However, this is not the case. The real case, which I'm going to show you right now, relates basically to exchange rates. So what actually happened is that from year 2013 to year 2014, Japanese yen weakened against the dollar. So if you go back to the average rates 2013 versus 2014, we can say that Japanese yen weakened against the dollar. So GPY weakened against dollars and how would this affect the earnings since the Japanese yen weakened against the, the dollars Toyota Toyota's major sales are outside Japan 
Accordingly, the revenue generated, the revenue collected from areas and regions outside Japan were collected in foreign currencies and then they were converted to Japanese yen. And when they were converted to Japanese yen, they generated a big sum of money for Toyota. On the other hand, Toyota's production facilities and their headquarters are located in Japan. So their expenses were paid in Japanese yen. However, their revenues were collected in foreign currencies. Revenues collected in foreign currencies were subsequently converted to Japanese yen at a high rate, whereas expenses were paid at a low rate. Therefore, increases in revenues and decreases of expenses were not related to sustainable activities. They were simply related to changes in exchange rate, which affected their operating income by 260 billion Japanese yen. Why I provided this example? I provide this example because this transaction is completely in line with IFRS. However, the earnings are non-sustainable. Since those earnings are non-sustainable, as an analyst, you need to identify if the growth is an organic growth or the growth is in relation to non-recurrent, low-quality, non-sustainable earnings. Another example we're going to look at right now uh, is the example of when it is within I4S, when financial reporting is within I4S, but they have biased choices. This example, basically, we are talking here about choices of accounting rules. What I remember, there was a rumor spread about their quality machinery output. This can be the case, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure if this uh, had a direct relation with the revenues and expenses that were reported in year 2014-2013. Thank you for sharing this, Lucina. I would like to look into it more deeply later on. Um, it happened in USA. Okay, okay. I'm gonna look into this later on to see what it is about. For now, uh, we're gonna look at incidents where the company is using IFRS but they have vice choices. As you know, financial reporting standards provide us options in financial reporting. For example, the depreciation methods. We can adopt different depreciation methods for different machinery, different property, different plan, different equipment. Choices of inventory cost law assumption. We can use LIFO, we can use FIFO. Both of them are acceptable, but many times companies adopt one of those methods in order to manipulate or in order to improve on their financial reporting. Another examples are the choice of fixed asset, asset subsequent measurement. As you know, based on international accounting standard number 16, companies are allowed to use either the cost model or the revaluation model to present their fixed assets. Accordingly, sometimes companies, they adopt the revaluation model in order to improve on their financial reporting. Those can be biased choices. As well, we can look at the choices of investment classification. Companies acquiring stocks or bonds that are available for or where the company does not have a major active role in managing the companies or the investments. Companies can follow one of the classifications. The investments can be held for trading or they are measured at fair value through PNL. Investments can be held to maturity or they are held with no intention to trade or with the intention only to collect specific payments of principal and interest. Then the company would be investing for the purpose of holding the investments and collect the returns, which is interest in this case, which are fixed returns rather than variable returns. And the third classification is whenever companies are holding the investment in equity instruments as a strategical investment. So depending on the method or depending on the ability and intent of holding those securities, um, the classification would differ and the accounting for them would differ. So if a company saw that one of their securities is increasing in prices, they would say, guess what? Our intention upon initial acquisition was to trade or our intention upon initial acquisition was to hold at fair value through P&L. That's here. And for other investments that their values are going down, if the market is moving against the stock price or the bond price, the company would say, I was holding this investment at cost. So the availability of options and financial reporting allows companies to make such presentations and to manipulate the figures. For example, 
based on IS1, International Accounting Standards number one, there are no clear cut rules which indicate whether companies should present certain items as operating or non operating. So basically, International Accounting Standards one, when they are discussing income statement, they do not oblige or they do not create clear cut rule, a hard and fast rule on whether certain accounts or certain transactions should be classified as operating or non-operating. In year 1999, Trump Hotels Resorts announced third quarter's earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization of $106 million, which was a significant increase. However, after looking in depth into those accounts, it turned out that it excluded a one-time charge of $81 million, but included a one-time gain of $17.2 million. If the EBITDA of Trump Hotels and Casino Resorts included this one-time loss and excluded this one-time gain, the results, the actual results of EBITDA would have been a loss. So in this case, the company used a biased choice of a classifying operating income or classifying a non-operating income within operating incomes and they adopted another choice of classifying a one-time expense as a non-operating expense so here it's acceptable it is within IFRS but it's a biased choice that would improve the performance that would improve the result of performance result of activities and financial position of the company now we're gonna go down to within IFRS but earnings management in this case the companies would actually be following IFRS but they are intentionally manipulating the records in this case we can see delaying the booking of allowance for slow moving inventory delaying the allowance for doubtful debts ignoring the likelihood of contingencies ignoring the probability of a certain um, a probability of certain provision occurring, ignoring impairment of long lived assets, impairment of, um, um, of the company's goodwill, ignoring allowance for sales return, manipulating the discount rate used in valuation of certain assets. So basically, in this case, we are looking at an intention. The company intentionally defers a certain expense. The company intentionally recognizes revenue early. And now the cutoff is when the company starts performing or booking transactions outside IFRS. And I have a long list here for you of entities that actually violated the financial reporting standards just to stay in the markets. I can name a few of them. And then in 2001, created special purpose entities. You can call them SPEs, special purpose entities, SPVs, special purpose vehicles, VIEs, variable interest entities. All those are the same meaning, different names for the same meaning. They all mean uh, a carve out. They all mean spinning off part of the debts and part of the toxic assets. So they spinned off part of the debt and part of toxic assets and they reflected them in separate financial statements of an entity which was not consolidated within Andron. So you tell me if Andron was able to spin off those assets and spin off those liabilities, then at the end of the day, they would be reflected in the consolidated financial statements of Andron. Yes, this is the case in case Andron declared that they own the majority or they own a controlling interest in those companies and in case Andron consolidated those entities. However, back then, some of the key entity personnel of Andron acquired the major share of those companies and Andron was owning only an immaterial, insignificant, non-controlling part. However, there were some binding agreements that mentioned and confirmed that Andron is the owner and Andron governs the operating and financial decisions of those companies. Another example was for Andron to mark to market, also in 2001, Andron used mark to market accounting for some of their assets, and this is not allowed to use on the company's assets and balance sheet. Another issue was that Andron reported full revenues and cost of services where they acted as agents. So as you know, if a company is acting as an agent, the company cannot report all the revenues and expenses that are 
related to a certain transaction. When a company is operating as an agent, the company must report only commissions which are in relation to this transaction. What actually happened is that Enron acted as agent. They recorded full revenues, full cost of services, and then their profit mar gross profit margin increased. Another example is WordCom in 2002, where WordCom, uh, they booked line costs as capital expenditures. So instead of expensing those line costs, they actually capitalized those line costs. And by capitalizing a certain expense, there is a major impact on the cash flow statement. So when you capitalize an expense, what happens? Capitalizing expense effect on cash flow statement. When a company capitalizes the expense, what's the effect on the cash flow statement? If we will compare cash flow operations versus cash flow from investing activities, what would the effect be? So a company capitalized part of their expenditures. How would your cash flow from operations be affected? And how would the cash flow from investing activities be affected? Okay, so Maruf is saying cash flow from operations would increase. That's the right answer. Cash flow from operations would increase basically because an expenditure, an operational expenditure, is an outflow from a cash flow from operations. So if it was not reflected as an expense, it will not be reflected as an outflow in the cash flow from operations, and the cash flow from operations will look more positive. However, when you book it as a cash flow from investing activities, it is negative. And negative cash flow from investing activities is favorable for the company. So negative CFI is favorable. What does it mean? It means that the company is investing in a property, the company is investing in equipment, the company is investing in growth, the company is growing its operational base. Okay? So when companies such as WordCom capitalize their expenses rather than expensing them in the same period, their cash flow from operations would be better and the cash flow from investing will look negative, but after all, a cash flow from investing which is negative is not too bad. Another example that happened lately was Mobile, where they booked premature revenues from wholesale or broadband leases and mobile promotional campaigns. Another example is Al Ma'jal in Saudi Arabia, where they capitalized part of their losses as accounts receivable. So what happened in Al Ma'jal, as far as I know, the report is not published yet. There is no clear report issued by the Saudi Capital Market Authority, no report issued by the regulators in Saudi. But as far as I know, Al Ma'jal engaged in a transaction which is capitalizing their losses on projects. They had several projects running in parallel construction projects. They had losses on some of those construction projects. Instead of increasing their losses and expenses and decreasing their net income, they actually increased their receivables from their customers. And then after a couple of years, a new CEO came. He said, I don't want to see those receivables anymore on the balance sheet. Then I will actually write them off. They wrote them off in PNL and they thought that they will start with a clean sheet. And then this opened an investigation, and now Al Majad is suspended from being traded on Saudi Stock Exchange. Uh, the last thing that happened was Toshiba in 2015, where they understated projects cost on long-term projects. All those transactions are non-compliant with IFRS. So those are an extreme case of earnings manipulation. And now we're going to move to the worst case of earnings manipulation, which is recording fictitious transactions. Recording fictitious transactions is about recording transactions that never happened. Creative accounting. Okay? So here we are looking at, for example, equity funding corporation where created fictitious revenues and fictitious policyholders. Other companies creating fictitious customers. 
Parmalat in 2004 uh, re reporting fictitious bank balances. Satyam, which is a computer company in India, reporting fictitious bank accounts as well for 500 million US dollars. They forged the bank statements, they forged the bank confirmations to the auditors, and they reported that some of the accounts existed, but in fact they did not exist. So, after looking at all those, after looking at the spectrum of financial reporting quality from following IFRS to creating fictitious transactions, now I will give you two tools that would help you either identify earnings manipulation or identify whether a company will go bankrupt or not. Those two tools, in fact, are quantitative tools. So basically, you're going to use them in order to make or calculate a certain score and this score will provide you an indicator about whether the company is in fact manipulating their revenues manipulating their earnings or not and whether the company will most likely face bankruptcy or not i will start with the first tool which is the benish model the benish model or the m score describes the degree to which earnings are manipulated benish actually developed a model, a regression analysis model. Um, uh, he inputted into this model certain indexes which indicate whether there has been an earnings manipulation. The formula for the Benish model is basically to calculate the M-score and is as such minus 4.84 plus 0.92 DSR plus 0.528 GMI. What are those? Why did they add this? I'm going to explain one of those for you to understand what was the concept behind Benish model. In the M-score, Benish said that he will provide a coefficient of 0.92 to the day sales receivable index. As the receivables as a percentage of sales increase from previous year to the current year, this is a higher indicator that the company is actually manipulating its revenues. Why? Because if accounts receivable are increasing at a faster pace than revenues, this means that the receivable in the current year will be higher than the receivable in the previous year as compared to sale. So receivable in the current year divided by sales current year all divided by receivables previous year, divided by sales in the previous year, shows us if the day sales receivable index is increasing. The more the day sales receivable index is increasing, this means that the M score will be higher or it will range more towards zero. The higher the M score, the higher the likelihood that the company is committing earnings manipulation. So basically, one of the factors that I explained is the days sales receivable index which indicate the relationship between receivables and sale higher receivable as percentage of sale or higher increase of receivable as compared to the increase of sale this is an indicator that the company is recording revenues or sales which are not being collected so high dsr index equals high receivables not being collected and what does this mean this is an indicator that fictitious revenues or low quality earnings are reflected in the income statement Let's go now to interpret the Benish model or formula. So you do calculate each and every one of those. And at the end, you will compare the M score to a threshold or to a limit. It is minus 1.78. If the M score is above minus 1.78, above 1.78, it means it ranges between minus 1.78 and zero or it's positive. So an M score, higher than minus 1.78, this is an indicator of earnings 
manipulation. Which means, as the M score approaches zero, or if it is positive, then most likely manipulation is happening. Now how to calculate or how to identify the likelihood, the percentage likelihood of manipulation or the probability of manipulation. If we look over here, we see that if the score of M score is minus 1.78, then the likelihood of manipulation is 3.8%. As it approaches 0 to minus 1.49, the probability of earnings manipulation increases to 6.8%. So how would you identify the probability? To identify the probability, you can use the help of Excel. And the formula is norm dist. Norm dist means that this is a normally distributed probability. Why? Because M score is normally distributed. It is considered to be normally distributed, symmetrical from both sides. So normally distributed. X is the M score that you actually calculated in this formula. So you calculate the M score. You input it in the Excel normal distribution, result of M score, zero, which means that the mean is zero, average is zero, the average M score is zero, one, it means one standard deviation around the mean and true to provide you the result. Formula explained, it's a normally distributed test, the M score figure with a mean of zero, standard deviation of one and true. Once you do this, it will give you the probability of earnings manipulation. As we said, as the M score approaches zero, the higher the probability that your financial statements or the, your, or the company that you are analyzing's financial statement is actually manipulated. Is M score successful? Yes. Back in the days, Students in Cornell University were able to correctly identify that Enron was manipulating its earnings. No one was believing those students. No one believed them. They were being taught the M score at university. They calculated the M score for Enron. And based on their conclusions, they concluded that Enron is actually manipulating their financial statements and earnings. If those people had some money or all the, if those people were in the financial markets, they would have earned some profits by going short on Enron. Who went short on Enron? There was one analyst who actually was always pro going short on Enron. His name was James Chanos. James Chanos shorted Enron stocks in November 2000 when one of the Enron stocks was at its peak. By November 2000, Enron stock was ranging between $90 and $100. By November 2001, Enron stock was at $20. By January 2002, Enron went bankrupt and the stock was at $1. So if you went short on the stocks of Enron by using the M score in year November 2000, now you would have been one of the wealthiest people around the world. Another tool to calculate the potential of companies Manipulation or bankruptcy is the Altman z-score. So the Altman z-score calculates the potential bankruptcy, whereas Benish model calculates the probability of earnings manipulation. What is the formula for Altman z-score and how Altman developed this? Altman in 1960s, Edward Altman developed the bankruptcy predictor model or z-score. The z-score um, allows you to know the potential of bankruptcy within two years of bankruptcy or two years before the bankruptcy occurs. He performed his test on 66 companies. Out of those 66, 33 failed and 33 successful. Out of the 33 who failed, all of the 33 had the same fundamentals. And out of the 33 that were successful, all the 33 also had the same fundamentals and its accuracy rate was 95%. So what was the formula? Again, 
Altman performed a regression analysis, a multiple regression analysis, where he wanted to generate a value for Z, which is the Altman Z-score. For Z, which is the dependent variable, he concluded that the dependent variable generates its value from independent variables, which are X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, which are mentioned over here. Working capital to total assets, retained earnings to total assets, earnings before interest to total assets, market value of equity to book value of liabilities, and sales to total assets. He provided a weight which we call a coefficient to each one of those independent variables or explanatory variables. So X1, X2, X3, X4, and X5, we call them explanatory variables. Explanatory variables, it means that they have the ability to explain a dependent variable, which is Z. He provided as well a weight to each and every one of those explanatory variables and the more this explanatory variable is important to predict bankruptcy, the higher the coefficient that it was provided. So basically, he built this model. He said, we are trying to explain Z. To explain Z, which is the explained, the variable would like to explain. We will focus on explanatory or independent variables which are X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And for each and every one of those, we're going to give them a slope or a slope or a coefficient. Accordingly, if you are a publicly listed entity, a publicly listed manufacturing entity, you should calculate, or if you are following a publicly listed manufacturing entity, you should calculate the working capital to total assets, retained earnings to total assets, earnings before interest and taxes to total assets, market value of equity to book value of liabilities, where market value of equity is being the stock price. If it's a public entity, then you should be able to get the stock price. Market stock price multiplied by the number of shares uh, which are authorized and issued and publicly traded. And sales to total assets. After making those calculations, you would try to interpret the results. So if you are a publicly manufacturing entity, publicly listed manufacturing entity, if your Z-score is above 2.99, then you are safe. If it is between 2.77 and 2.99, then caution is required. If it is between 1.8 to 2.7, then there is a likelihood of getting bankruptcy within two years. And when the Z-score is below 1.88, then there is a very high likelihood that the company will actually go bankrupt within the coming two years. Now, the average for the 33 companies that he was following was 5.02 for the non-bankrupt or the successful companies, the companies that survived, the survivors. Whereas the average for bankrupt companies or the failed companies was minus 0 0.29, negative. When it is a negative, it means that one of those will be negative. Either the retained earnings would be a deficit or losses roll forward, or the earnings here will be a loss, or in the working capital will be having current liabilities higher than current assets. Because as you know, working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So if your current liabilities are higher than your current assets, working capital will be negative. Retained earnings, accumulated losses, this would lead to negative Z-score. So apparently companies that failed or when bankrupt, in fact, either had negative working capital or negative retained earnings, accumulated losses, or negative earnings before interest and taxes. Sales cannot be negative, and market value of equity cannot be negative. We do not have a negative market price per share. It's either zero or positive. So whether retained earnings or working capital, if they are low or negative, then it's a high indicator that your company would go bankrupt. So. Those are the formulas again. This is the working capital, current assets minus current liabilities, retained earnings, earnings for interest, book value of equity, and sales. Why here we change to book value of equity? Because here we are looking for Z-test model for private companies. And the previous one, we're looking at public companies. So this is for a public company. In case of a public company, you would look at the market value of equity because for a public company, its share is listed, it's publicly traded, you know its share price. Whereas if we are looking at a private company, 
we do not have the market price per share, then we will look at the book value of equity. And the book value of equity is the capital or common stocks, additional paid in capital, reserves, and retained earnings, which are reflected as equity. A third model was developed for non-manufacturing industries, non-manufacturing trading companies and emerging markets. As you know, nowadays the markets are separated into three tiers, three levels. We have the developed markets, whereas most of their companies have been listed on the stock exchange. We have the developing market, under developing market, we have the emerging market and frontier markets. So if you are operating or if you are analyzing a company in the emerging market, or if you are analyzing a non-manufacturing company publicly traded on a developed market, then the ratios become current assets minus current liability over total assets, which is working capital, the retained earnings to total assets, earnings before interest and taxes to total assets, and book value of equity to total liabilities. Here, the coefficients or slopes or the importance changes. As you can see, in the emerging markets or non-manufacturing industrial market, they provided a higher weight, a higher slope for working capital because in those markets, maintaining working capital is pretty much important. So here the coefficients change. So how can we conclude? If you are a privately, or if you are analyzing a private company, or if you are a private company and you would like to assess the potential for bankruptcy, you would compare the Z-score to those ranges, brackets, or thresholds. If you are a publicly listed manufacturing company, you would compare the Z-score to, th to those thresholds or cutoff values. If you are a non-manufacturing traded company or if you are following or analyzing a company in the emerging market, then you should basically compare the Z-score to those ratios. Many other tools were being used in order to evaluate earnings quality of a company, but today we will stick only for two. We'll be sticking to the Z-score test in order to identify the potential of bankruptcy of a company, and we'll be sticking to the M-score test in order to verify if there has been any earnings manipulation. So in this session, we actually introduced what is financial reporting quality. We introduced what is the earnings quality. We introduced the quality spectrum and how the quality can be degraded from following IFRS with high earnings quality to fictitious accounting transactions. And we introduced two techniques to assess the earnings quality, which are the M-score and the Z-score. And that's it for this webinar. I open the floor for you now, ladies and gentlemen, to ask any questions. If you have any questions, I will be more than glad to answer them. So if you have any questions, If you would like me to drop for you an email regarding the material, if you would like me to drop for you an email regarding the content of this webinar, please write down your emails. Write down your emails in the chat window so that I can share with you this information. Thank you, Lucina. Thank you for your feedback. Okay, Nabil, I received your email. I will send you shortly the slides of this webinar so that you use the M-score, so that you use the Z-score. 
You're most welcome, Fernanda. If you would like to share with me your email, I'll be more than glad to send you by mail the slides of this webinar. Osama, Zakaria, Maher, anyone, if you would like me to share the slides. Sure, Osama, I will send you the emails by email the slides. Please write down your Okay, so those are the emails of the participants who are interested in receiving the slides. I would like to thank you again for this 45 minutes or one hour where we discussed the earnings manipulation M score and Z score tests to identify earnings manipulation. Again, um, thank you on behalf of Merck and I hope you have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thanks. Merck.com.